Welcome to Rugby Nation episode 10, uh, all things rugby and fashion with the blue sweater there, Pato, very schoolboy of you. Oh, it's very schoolboy of you. <laughs> I'm trying to end. It's cold out. It is, it is. And uh, welcome Justin Harrison, former Wallaby great, uh, classic Wallabies mentor and all-round champion bloke. Is that, a, is that a fair intro? Yeah, it's close to spot on. Okay, Living great. legends probably missing, but yeah. we'll get to that later. Yeah, also, we'll, we'll, also won a line series, I think. That's right, Single you did that. You did the line out thing with the arm stuff. Can yeah. we just settle something? You played 25 tests, you tell us, every single day. 26. 25. 25. Cool. You got him covered? What was that? You got him covered for the test count? I've got him covered. Got him, I've got him covered for starting test count. How many of those tests you start? Doesn't Adam? matter, mate. There's finishes and starters. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both got me covered. Yeah, well, stuck on zero. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. We're kicking it off with this, right? Wallabies jersey announced during the week. Your thoughts? Yeah, oh, look, I don't mind it. I think um, the simpler the better when it comes to Wallabies jerseys. You don't want to be mucking around and putting sw- swooshes and you know big. Um, paint splashes all over it, so yeah, pretty solid. You know, no collar. Um, swooshes would make it Nike. Yeah, yeah that's well. true. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, because they had that thing down. The, when you say swoosh, they had that sort of graphic down the side last yeah, World Cup. Yeah, and in, in, in other World Cups, oh, yeah. they've had sort of panels and stick yep. with the 07 World Cup. So you know, they, I think they've really gone for a, a classic look. I guess you'd say. Um, well, yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. And oh, I just think the collar it looks quite football esque, like a, a, a soccer a jersey, but I actually think it works, and I actually do think, from a rugby perspective, if it'd be hard to grab you by the collar, and I'm just looking at it from a practical point of view around scrummaging things, I actually really like it. But the thing for mine is, it's a different gold. It's a more of a... a gold, gold. Gold, gold? It's more gold, gold. It's gold, gold, question it's mark. less yellow gold. Yeah. No, I, I really do like it. But um, the talk has been that the Wallabies are going to be playing in... An indigenous jersey. Which yeah, well, this is um, looks like this is the other uh, revelation for this week is the alternate, um, which is obviously um, the reverse of the indigenous um, jersey. I believe it's a, it's the same um, motifs and so on. Dennis oh, Goulding's um, work there. Um, so yeah, that they're, they're uh, looking to wear that against Uruguay and potentially a semi final. Um, they're still waiting on some um, approvals and obviously making it, but. Um, uh, that'd be great. You wouldn't want to take the spring box on in it. That'd be interesting. But um, did they make a big deal out of jersey launches back in the day? I mean, 03, can you remember? Google, were you <laughs> sort of standing on a, on a stage with smoke pumping and drums no. beating? And I was on a very dry paddock up in Darwin with some Birkenstocks on and a red beard, standing behind Greg's looking particularly unathletic with a jersey that was way too big for me. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, certainly didn't have the smoke and mirrors that it has. Uh, now. Well, can I just say that it's that the 03 jersey is very fondly remembered. We ran a comp on rugby.com.au channels and showdown between all the eight jerseys and it got whittled down to two finalists, 99 versus 2003, which is pretty much the same jersey. But anyway, in 2003 won. Cool. So uh, yeah. people have got very fond memories of that. I that voted campaign. 07, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I just thought that was a dynasty of a, of a campaign and the players that went through in that era and that World Cup were fabulous players, Justin, and I just thought that it was best that I voted for that. In 07? Yeah. Right. Unlucky in the quarters, but <laughs> yeah. I think that's the only World a Cup real, I played a in. Real, a um, real dynasty of players. Speaking yeah. of players playing World Dynasties, there was one player um, that I remember in last World Cup that we're not talking about a lot now. We're going to get straight into the footy. Mm. Will Skelton, what's doing? Because... Chatter around him is quite grey, but what is black and white that he is playing the house down over in Europe, playing in a good team, we all add with that good, but can he be a possible candidate to be wearing this jersey at the end of the year? Well, yeah, let me try and fill you in on a little bit what's happening. Will's obviously playing for Saracens. Um, I think he's got a new contract. Uh, he's coming off contract, pardon me. He had said recently that whilst the Aussies had been in touch and wanted him to come back, um, he was going to stay. But we've we've heard this week that Saracens are now saying that Will is keen to play at the World Cup. Um, so apparently uh, Checker's over there doing his magic. Um, we may well see um, 
will sign one of these deals like Matt Tamua did, where you come back to play for the Wallabies, then pop back to England, play another season and before eventually moving home. So um, from what seemed like uh, no chance for Skelton to come back, um, there now seems like there is some chance. And the one thing that you didn't do, Justin, is when you went overseas, your stock price was high back here. And this is with all due respect, that it's a wallaby, like, killing it here for Australia, then going overseas to, I wouldn't say to end your career, where players are now sort of going the opposite way of going overseas, their stock price goes through the roof and they come back home. Is there a bit of that about Will Skelton, do you think? Do you think he's the player that the Wallabies need? Is he worth pursuing? Well, it was a whole different dichotomy of decision-making back then. Once you went offshore, you weren't eligible to play, no matter how many tests you played. And Australia wasn't interested in bringing you back because we had a dearth of talent and we had a high-performance model here that was pretty hard to get back into once you left it. Uh, I think we've got to be careful about recruiting guys that are playing well in different programs and different environments and thinking that they're going to play the same and perform the same in a completely different environment, uh, different faces, different language. Uh, you know, I think that the the environment that Will will come back into is Southern Hemisphere rugby, very different to Northern Hemisphere rugby. Saracens is pretty much uh, a South African English national team, uh, and playing on artificial turf, home grounds. You know, you just got to be careful about looking for the cherry at, at the top of the shelf before you start developing what you've got in front of you. Well, I reckon they should pick him because not only I think I get what you say there, Gug, but I think. Purely from, like, there's so many different reasons, but a big carrying lock that can is solid in set piece. Scrum he's time. a great player. Yeah. He, yeah. When he first came, his first test, I remember France uh, stepped off his left, delivered a lovely ball midfield, scored a wonderful try, beat a heap of French defenders, and I voted him sort of man of the match that day, which which was just nice for me to be able to do for a second row that had such a big impact on the mm. game. And he's, he's performing very well. Uh, we just need to make sure that he's going to perform that well in an Australian environment that's asking itself a lot of questions at the yeah, moment. Yeah, look, the other consideration is, you know, the knock-on effect, right? It's all very well for the national coach to want a player now to play in it and he might do the good job. But what does it tell, you know, another decent player down the track when he's being told, stay for the jersey, stay for the Wallabies jersey, stay in Australia, stay for your Super Rugby um, and you see sort of the pursuit of guys overseas. Look, I'm the same. I like to see as many good Aussies in the team as possible mm. and getting creative about bringing them home, fine with that. But you just got to also weigh up the fact that there may be consequences afterwards. Speaking of which, David Pocock announced, we talk about players playing in the World Cup, good players playing in the World Cup. David Pocock announced that he is not going to play for the Brumbies anymore and say goodbye or sayonara to the Super Rugby system. Part of me was happy for Poey that he took it upon himself to, to make that call and that announcement, get it out there because he's been asked so many times. He has been carrying somewhat of an injury. But we haven't really seen the best of David Pocock the last four years. Um, love what he does off the field. Gold jersey, doing a sensational job. But from a super rugby level, gee, I would have liked to have seen him play a bit more. Initial thoughts when you, when you saw the press conference, and he, he did talk for a while. Yeah, I, look, I think that... Um the decision to draw a line on the Super Rugby career was essentially so that the pressure of trying to get back for each week for the Brumbies had ceased. He was getting asked about it every week. It's you know, it's like the the curse of a guy with a long term injury. How's the knee, mate? How's mm. the knee, mate? How's the knee, mate? You know, like and trying to to get back each week, the coach was being asked about it. So they just said, look, you know what? It's actually not going to happen. So let's call draw a line under it. Get your focus back on to the Wallabies. Um, but yeah, you're right. Look, you know. Dave's been down there and suffered some rotten luck. I think he, he you know, had back-to-back -back knee injuries. He played 43 games for the Brumbies. And when when did he arrive there? 2013, 2012? It feels like a while ago. So it's yeah. a long time. Yeah. Um, and um, I think the best we've seen Dave play in his, probably in his entire career was at the 2015 World Cup. You know, He's actually been a bit of a World Cup specialist. When you think about it, 2011, he was enormous as well. Yeah. So um, the, the hope really is that he's fit by this next World Cup. And, and you have to say there's some major doubts. He's had this calf injury for three months. Oh, it fit. hasn't knitted, apparently. There's, a, there's, a, there's an it? issue. It's a very rare kind of um, uh, complaint with that calf that the, the muscle isn't knitting. Um, so there's some, uh, you'd have to say there is real doubt about whether he can come back because genuinely no one has a really good, strong time. 
Look, good from your end. We need him at the World Cup, but we also need to see what else is on the shelves because, um, you know, we've got hoops there at seven. Question for you, if Poey doesn't go to the World Cup, who is the next seven? That's a whole different conversation between the blokes that know a lot more than, than me, but I, I probably, you know, I think... Well, where's Liam Gill? Is he coming back home or is he yeah, stuck That's over starting there? to raise... He's gone. Raise its head. Um, anyway, Sean McMahon. Can't sorts of back He's in. But mm. It's an interesting question. Um, yeah. But, I mean, you would, you, would, you would suddenly change the look of that team, what they've been running, that pooper combination for a while now, haven't they? So um, you've got, you know, in terms of... Pocock's been playing eight, and then he so you've got Issy Nicerani. And it hasn't coming been working. Through. So it's yeah. probably a fortuitous forced decision anyway, more than anything. We'll move on from Poey. F- played 43 games, as you said before. Missed 57, and that's excluding his sabbatical. So, look, we'll just have to wait and see. But let's get back onto the Brums' big win. Sabbatical. Yeah. Sabbatical's time off. Is it? it? Okay. Yeah. Right, I'm saying. Didn't see much time off that. during that game. Anyway, Brumby's... They were awesome against the Bulls, right? And they are clearly, I called it here a few weeks back, the competition favourites from an Australian team point of view. Uh, they should take out that conference now. They play the Sunwolves in Tokyo this week. That's all about for and against. They're going to win that game. What's the calculation from the Tars point of view, Peter? What do they need to do to scrape through to the finals? Oh, like They've got to win every game and hope, you know, half a dozen teams above them lose every game. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's that classic when you've got to get the abacus out and you're a mathematical chance, you're no chance. You know, how many times have we, we seen that? Um, funnily enough, the Waratahs have named their team this week with all the blokes in it, Sukopi Kepu, Rob Simmons, who who has yet to um, sit out their Wallaby mandated rest. And Daryl Gibson told us that Kirtley Bill, Hooper and Bernard Foley all need another week too. So there's five guys in the tube for another week off and there's three games left. So I don't know how he's planning to manage that, but it might be a, um, might be a threadbare team come the last round against the uh, Highlanders. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But the other thing I want to see more of, not, I would love to see three Australian teams go through to the finals, but Justin, for you, the crowds at the Brumbies... Um, I love Phil Thompson's honesty in this, and I love Dan McKellar, the way he presents it to the media. Um, Phil, Phil Thompson will go pretty clear on record that they need their type of Viking clap, which they've got in rugby league. But Dan McKellar, that side is primed for a small town, a country town of, of that of Canberra, and they get behind their teams, and you've been in the heyday there, Gug. How can we get more Brumbies fans to the game? I think it's travelling at around between eight, 9,000, where I think Raiders are seeing about twelve to 13, but... They're a side that could potentially win the Super Rugby title, but their fans are staying at home. Is it just purely because it's too cold? Oh, no. I mean, anecdotally, we've seen Canberra crowds are used to watching rugby or any in any guys in the cold. Um, you know, frostbite and noses falling off when the crowd when people come out and it's minus six. But look, I think it's just a it's just a reflection that the Canberrans are sport for choice. They've got. A, a, a choice between Canberra Raiders and Brumbies. Canberra Raiders were first to plate in terms of performing well. There's a swing crowd of probably half, 40% of any given day match days have got season passes or tickets to both matches and they just make a choice on the day. And I think uh, the Brumbies are just suffering from the Canberra Raiders performing well at the moment and dominating that market space. I'd love to see, if they play a home semi or a quarter, they'll, they've got to get over south of 10, they've got to get 12, otherwise it doesn't be covered. It's the classic um, case, struggling the, in, in every state to be honest, it's trying to get that connectivity back between the club game, the school game and the pro game um, and that's not an issue exclusive to Canberra. Um, you know, I'd love to see. You, you get, this is the time for sort of radical thinking, really, isn't it? You know, I'd love to see Super Rugby clubs get back to um, being kind of genuine rep teams, right? You know, like maybe contract half as many guys and have the rest as fluid floating back and forth from from club rugby. So those club guys can say, "There's my guy. He's gone. He's been called up to the Brumbies this week or the Waratahs this week or something." So just get that sense of like they're representing us up at the Waratahs and and. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, we've been talking about this issue for a long time about trying to fix those connectivity issues, and and it doesn't seem like that that um, the the trend is reversing. If anything, it's going down. I like that. I like that. That was like back back in my day, and you'll say the same thing is that Jason Little was the first non New South Welshman, Tian Strauss, those types coming into the Waratahs, and it was 
the Shoot Shield All Stars. So there's some merit to that. Or maybe we'll plug into that uh, in another show um, dedicated to that. Because I reckon that's a we could talk at that for a while. Um, I'll quickly talk about the Rebels and the Sumbles because the Rebels just thrashed them. And the real news out of that was Will Genia was just lying on the deck there. Um, I saw it live and I thought this doesn't look too serious but then when they all ran out and they, they're just going through precautionary measures when you lie there from a concussion put the smelling salts in and he's back this Friday night um, and they play against the Waratahs at Amy Park I'm just going to ask for a tip straight up uh, in the Weary Dunlop Shield you Pato yeah I'd still like the Rebels in this one um, I mean it's it, it's a classic it's, it's the season in general every conference it's very hard to tip and you know, I'd probably get egg in, my, egg in my face and the Waratahs would win this one. But the Rebels have everything to play for. Their first final series, if they win this game, it's pretty much locked in. So, mm. um, and uh, overall, the contest is, you know, has a subtext about Wallabies' positions. There's lots of guys going head-to-head -head there. Um, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on the locks, actually, because you've got um, Hannigan and Simmons up against Coleman and Phillip. Phillip's um, been going good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look, I First, let me just touch on Will Genia. I'm really surprised he's playing. Like I, I, cannot, I cannot see how he's managed to pass a concussion test, being clearly knocked out and spasming with his hand on the field. So th the protocol is you're supposed to have visual, a visual report done by an independent person, observer, on the ground of immediate post-event uh, symptoms, whether he walked off or not, and whether he was able to remember who he was playing, where he was playing, and what his colour of his jersey was, is not a true reflection of what happened. He had major trauma to the side of his head from a knee, blunt force to the side temple here, and I just, I just feel that we're just, you know, that's just really going to have some hairs on it if this, if if he's playing this soon after a major significant spark out. Anyway. Got to have faith in the Melbourne Rebels medical and all those sorts of things, but having been a part of the coaching environment for a while, I knew that the HIA rules are there for a reason and it's not just about passing a series of questions. Anyway, there you go, got off my chest. Uh, yeah. the, no, no, but the, talk the, about the locks, the locks Justin, and, yes. and, and give me a tip. And I, look, it's a fair shout, right? But we'll get that on record. But the locks in this one are going to play a huge role. Stand out to those four locks, but also a tip for you for this game. Oh, look, you know, there's got, you've got all sorts of different things happening. Rob Simmons is, is looking to try and find form again. He's clearly a leader in that Waratahs pack, in a, in a Waratahs pack that hasn't really delivered what it's supposed to have this year. Uh, but, but a leader in Talisman, and he's playing well around the field. Uh, Adam Coleman, is he distracted by going overseas? He's clearly looking to finish with some sort of um, uh, bang going to the World Cup. Those two, I think, will either one of those two will go to this next World Cup, not both. Uh, and I would say Adam Coleman before before Rob. Although you know, on the night anything can happen, and Adam we know is easily distracted. Um, and after that, I just think you know, I, I can't look past the tight five of the Brumbies. So I don't think actually the forward tight five battle is is what we're most interested in. Mm -hmm. I think we're most interested in the way that Guinea and Quade Cooper perform <coughs> against a back line that's improving uh, every week. Uh, the forwards, I think, uh, won't, be as, won't be as hotly contested for Wallaby positions as a Brumbies-Waratahs matchup will be. Interestingly, um, Daryl Gibson also didn't um, spare Bernard Foley some honest appraisals this week. So they, they were very disappointed with his game last week and you know expanded at length about the, the flaws in it against the Jaguars. So um, there's a bit of pressure on Bernard, no doubt about it. And Quade Cooper's been very solid this year, hasn't he? He hasn't been it was a period rocks or two, diamonds. Yeah, two games he slipped a bit, but yeah. I agree. I think he's been sound. As a, yeah. as a game manager... Um, he's doing the job. And, and as, as is Christian Leo the Fano, you're right. People forget the Brumbies. They've been hiding in plain sight all year. Mm. Christian's been outstanding. So there, are, there is plenty of pressure on Bernard for that number 10 shirt. Love it. We're talking about Wallaby selection. I love that. Which is um, also a good segue into probably one of the most iconic jerseys that we've got plenty of talk about. It was the Reebok Volcano Vomit. Uh, triangular one. Did you ever play a test in, in no, this didn't. jersey here? Look at this here. This is beautiful. Matt yeah. Burke pacing down. Uh, George Gregan sold his soul to promote that one. 
But the, gee, this is the thing, right? The pizza jersey, isn't it? It looked like slices yeah. of yellow yeah. and white pizza. Well, yeah. I can tell you some background on that. I interviewed John O'Neill um, recently and, and talked about that, and he said of he made many decisions that he that he regretted, but that was um, at the very top of them. Um, he said so that the the, rug, the ARU was, was then um, was on the bones of its bottom financially in 2006, and Reebok came and offered a bit of cash, but said, listen... Um, Gold, plain gold jerseys do not sell. We're not just, we're just not going to be able to sell them. Um, we got to change it, and uh, they took the filthy lucre and um, changed the jersey. Um, it obviously didn't get a, a great response. But I tell you what's funny, but and then they changed it back. But speaking of um, World Cup uh, jersey launches, they changed it back for the '99 um, well, World Cup. Um, yeah. Thankfully, imagine if John Eels had been <laughs> Mate, that in the jersey. Again. But it's funny because. That jersey like saw some pretty good performances. They you know pumped the uh, pumped the All Blacks three blot in yeah uh, nineteen ninety eight. If you watch um, that this day and age, like that looks alright. It was too baggy for oh, one. No, I, mean, I, you... play, I played in the schoolboys in nineteen, so I remember having that. But at the time, like I, you don't realise as a kid. But I don't mind not trialing, but like this has got to be all gold. I get it, yeah. World Cup, but. It's a national jersey, which I don't know. I, look, I didn't mind it. Like, I didn't mind it in the sense that they were trying to be different. Um, but I'm glad they've come full circle on this. But well, you know, it's not a fashion show, is it? It's a performance show. So you pretty much wear anything if it's got an Australian badge on it. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to hand it back. Could that be on your tombstone? It's a. Fa- it's not a fashion show. It's a performance show. Or your LinkedIn bio, or something Good. like that. What? Yeah. I quite Maybe. like. Uh, I like the idea of the good thing about the the World Cups is is having the alternate jersey, right? So you've got the ability to muck around with a second one and, and pitch that as a here's a here's a different thing for kids to wear or for your brother-in-law to buy or whatever, you know. Like, um, yeah, I mean, you. I, I don't think you'll find many people who want to experiment with the national jersey, but I don't see why that there shouldn't be a couple. And maybe you play one a year. Um, in the rugby championship or something in the alternate jersey, I don't know. I reckon if you had a the retro like it, jersey, the English like, do it a lot. Yeah, but if you had a, a a row of retro jerseys that some you could go and purchase right now, you would have a big group of people going for volcano vomit just because it represents. It's a bit of a write off. It's a bit cool. Oh, mate, I that's think just you're one. off your rocker. <laughs> well, okay, maybe that's that's a fair. The eighty seven uh, Adidas three stripes. Is- there you go. Yeah, but you're a lot older than me, Peter. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about it. Aussie Sevens, yep. they were awesome in London. And mm. Fantastic. Um, the best thing about that I found with the, the Sevens program, it was the the big dogs like Jesse Parahi, Sam Meyer. Sam did play a lot of minutes, but you can tell when we've got those big dynamic players. We're a different team. But the pick for mine was Henry Hutchinson. Like he, he played so well. And there's parts of the game where I see him, I'm going, gee, he'd be good in 15s. I know he's had a crack at it, but he's a genuine Sevens player. He was outstanding. Maurice was also great. But then you start to... There's a bit of bit of hope there now. And, and they've got a couple of signings and they're going to go after a couple of more as well. So that's just the first of many with Quadzilla. I know you like that thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but a lot to like about. So maybe the, the, short, the long-term pain and seeing the short-term wins here for, for Tim Walsh, it's starting to yeah, come it together. It seems like a simple game, doesn't it, Sevens, when you watch it, but it, it's in, you know, exceptionally complex, no doubt. The coaches will tell you. I think that you, you talk about the Hutchisons and the Maurice Longbottoms of the world stepping up, um, and I think a big part of that is that they've got some new guys in there, probably with a bit of fresh energy. You Hoodie? Know, raising Matthew, Hood. Matthew Hood, yeah. Lockie Miller, yeah. um, Josh Coward, Pincus, these sort of guys who are now represent you know the future direction of that team uh, and you're getting these other guys lifting Henry Hutchison's a young bloke but he's he's been around there's just a bit of fresh energy about that team they made the final obviously Fiji sort of turned in one of those Fiji days where you just got to shake your head and um, I think you know roll out the KFC did you see the the tweet that their celebration is um, you know 48 buckets of KFC they don't, <laughs> do, the, do. They don't do the bubbly but um, yeah, yeah no really positive 64 litres of carver was probably mixed upstairs <laughs> yeah. just quietly but that they um, great signs. They play again um, this weekend in Paris, um, and Henry Vanderglas, an old mate of yours, is he um, back? has been taken Vanders across. Is in. Yeah, Vanders is, is in. I'll tell you, um, just Henry, Henry Hutchinson, Ramwick, and Will Mid and Will Maddox, Ramwick, Henry Hutchinson, classic Wallaby. 
Yeah, well, he's played in a band is classic Wallaby. Yeah, there yeah, you go. So that's the common denominator. Will Maddox, Jack's Bod, brother, cl- classic yeah, Wallaby. Right. Yeah, Will he, Maddox has been, been taken over. I'm not sure whether he'll play or or he'll be thirteenth uh, man. But um, Henry Vanderglass, you would have played with him back in the day. Randwick, he was lost too early. Another one of these yep. guys that went overseas and is back now. So another big unit too. You know, like um, so. Yeah, in terms of looking towards that Oceania series, good. They're, they're sort of. Hopefully they they back it up with some decent form this week. Right up, um, that's a wrap, Justin. I'd like to thank you because you turned up today and you didn't touch your face, and I I, I appreciate that because we've spoken about that off air. Yeah. And Pato, uh, thanks as always for covering the game as you do, and thank you for listening in at home. Uh, Get the jerseys. Up. Yeah, they're on sale too. You'll be able to find it somewhere. And they are pretty um, cool. yeah, they they are pretty cool, uh, and it's a pretty cool panel too. We'll see you here next time.